What is the first preventative step you would take to keep plants safe from infestation? I write, assess all potential pest organisms for the crop, find multiple preventative and curative stratagems for each pest based on IPM control types, and then arrange stratagems into a unified strategy where preventative measures are actively implemented and curative measures are initiated aggressively with rapidity. And if you don't crop scout with documented records, do so. What this means is, is that the most important preventative step is to pre-plan. Find out your crop, find out what pests are associated with the crop, find the treatments for the pests so that you already have options when you first detect them. Don't assume that you won't get them, because you probably will. And if you don't, it's better to have them, the treatments, and not need them than to be in the reverse situation. And especially with pest control that uses biocontrol or focuses on biocontrol, because biocontrol agents work the best preventatively, or at the very least, when they're used on a pest population that isn't massive. But too many people don't crop scout and record their findings for posterity, so they have no way of finding the patterns in the system that cause or will that point to the cause of the pest problem. Can you go over some general personal protection equipment and basic tips when it comes to PPE that can apply to small tank allocators? Not really, to be honest, and especially not as well or as articulated as the UCIPM video that I referenced in my story, which I will have a link in the description for you to check out. Of course, it is mostly relevant to California, but it is good general information, and California tends to have pretty high standards for pesticide and personal protection equipment information. Is Bouveria bassiana effective in combating broad mites? Academic studies, which I will provide in the description below, suggest that Bouveria bassiana does indeed infest broad mite, Polyphagotarsinemus latus. But that doesn't mean that a Bouveria bassiana product would be an effective control for myriad reasons. The formulation might not be good, the pest population might be too high. There are a lot of factors that go into this. So, it doesn't necessarily mean that those are the products to use against broad mite, but it does mean that there might be at least some minimal or ancillary infection that happens if you use it with another, with another pest in mind or just as a preventative spray. You might knock out all of a population if it's very small, in fact, but you might only knock down 5% of the population if it's very massive. Can you do a root aphid video? I'm especially interested in life cycle and natural predators. Yes, absolutely. It is an organism high on my radar. The rice root aphid is a big pest, not just for the burgeoning cannabis industry, but also for other crops. And as you will note in this question, the life cycle is a very important aspect of control for any pest and natural predators are important for control in pesticide-restricted crops, which is becoming more and more a reality every day. Best way to combat mold issues in coastal regions? The answer depends on crop, cultivation site and resources, and the mold species, but generally the best investments tend to be in preventative measures that focus on environmental control, which isn't available to every situation. And that's a really, I mean, it's a vague answer, but that's because the question isn't very detailed. And I wasn't expecting people to have super detailed questions, but some questions require you to play 20 questions with the person to get all the right answers. That's why evaluations are typically on site because people might not even know the right questions to ask, and they may not even know what they're doing wrong in the first place, which is the reason why somebody might evaluate a site for problems. It's not a very satisfying answer to people who already have the mold problems and for which prevention is 
not a situation anymore. In those cases, however, your options are totally limited by what your crop is and what your products can be and what your products are that can be applied where you live and on that crop and how often, etc. It's a big, big question. What's your favorite kind of predators to use for two spot spider mites and russet mites? Really straightforward, good question. Not to imply that complex questions are any less valid. In fact, I like those more. But the answer here is very straightforward. For Tetranicidae, including Tetranicus urticae, the two spot spider mite, I think that a good preventative is Neocilius californicus. Partly because it goes after spider mites as a type 2 specialist, but also because it can go after pollen and it can also go after other organisms. Because it can establish in a crop and feed on pollen, that makes it a good preventative organism that you can establish with crops that produce pollen in like a companion planting setting or with added pollen from a biocontrol company. Phytocilius persimilis is great for curative situations where the Neocilius californicus maybe didn't work as well, maybe you have a hot spot, maybe you don't have any californicus out right now, but you do have an established population of spider mites. Persimilis is a specialist of specialists, a type 1a specialist. As for Areophyidae, russet mites, rust mites, and gall mites, I like to use Amblyceus swirskii. There's a lot of academic literature on the subject of using Swirskii and a few other predatory mites, uh, this one being a type 3b generalist that also feeds on pollen, so you can have that establishing effect of the mite in your crop as long as you have a plant that produces enough pollen. And most plants will, but ornamental peppers, and I have a video on the subject for Swirskii in particular that you can check out, is a great plant to use. There's a lot of literature on the subject of Swirskii against russet mites in particular, especially tomato russet mites, Aculops lycopersisi. Can you provide literature on trap crops and your opinion on their effectiveness? Yes, I rarely had success personally. Others seem to have success circumstantially. Personally, I think trap crops are a great idea, and I think that they work really well for certain crops, but not as well for others. I had a greenhouse operator who tried to use alfalfa to attract ligus bug, the tarnished plant bugs, which are a big problem in um, strawberries and a few other crops, and they're a big nuisance. But the alfalfa was supposed to attract the tarnished bug, the tarnished plant bug, and then also attract its predators, and then you were supposed to like cull the alfalfa and kill both at the same time or something. It, it didn't work out very well, but that could just be a sample size because I haven't also had very many options to utilize trap crops, but other people it seems to work very well for, so I have a feeling that it is very circumstantial in general. How do, will you, know what pests to strategize, expect, look out, and prepare for? Find academic relevant literature related to the crop in question regarding pests, like I said before. Most crop species have been cultivated long enough for this to exist, and if you're growing plants that are very popular, there will be an abundance of information on this subject. Also, you should note pests considered particularly difficult to manage and prioritize their control. If there are pests out there that are common and not such a big deal, all the more better to have a responsive plan. For pests that are much more difficult, way more important to have multiple preventative measures and curative measures if they exist. Sometimes the reason why a pest is difficult to manage is because there aren't a whole lot of options. And that's kind of the scary situation to be in because there's not a whole lot you can do in that sort of circumstance. Best IPM practices for powdery mildew. Depends on the crop and cultivation site, but in general, it's important to consider the environment and operate in a way that allows better control over the environment. Applying licit fungicidal materials preventatively before or during conditions conducive to its growth is common. Crop scouting and documentation of those conditions is essential to that effect. 
Some crops, depending on their location, have more options or less restrictions than others. It's sort of a vague question. It depends on a whole lot of things like where you are, what products are available to you, what's your price range, what are your resources, etc. But by and large, some of the most important practices are preventative, and unfortunately for people who grow in the outdoors, preventative measures don't exist as easily as they exist for indoor facilities, maybe for a vertical growing space that has a, or a high standard for biosecurity protocols in a way that a farm outdoors can't necessarily make use of. Have you calculated economic injury levels for spider mites on cannabis? Well, the answer is yes, but it's different for everyone. And I have established economic injury levels for spider mites and other pests as well. But I feel like it's very important for those levels to be customized to the cultivator in general, in specific. In a lot of crops, however, aside from cannabis, there are some general do's and don'ts, like especially with corn, for example. And because it seems like the strategies are pretty much going to be the same for everyone, and most people are growing corn in the same way, you're going to have very similar economic injury levels, and you're going to have very simil similar treatment thresholds. But for crops that have very different ways of growing, and very different cultivars, and very different cultivation approaches, you're probably going to have a very different economic injury level and treatment threshold for those situations. And I think that's one of the biggest differences between cannabis, for example, and a more established crop like corn or various orchards. What do you recommend are best sprays on the market in battling spider mites? Again, I can't really comment. Depending on where you are, you might not have access to the products that I like to use or that other people like to use. Certain provinces and crops have restrictions that make this answer tricky. Depending on the circumstances, sulfur and pyrethrin are rather ubiquitous, and that's kind of the best I can say. Those are two compounds that are very common. Like I say, they're very ubiquitous in the pest control world. It is less likely that you will run into problems with them. But that doesn't mean that they're going to work for you, nor are they going to be best in every circumstance. Every cultivation site is different, and it might make more sense to use one rather than the other, or both or neither. How often should we be spraying? Again, it's really hard to know the answer to this without knowing what the product is, what the crop is, and what the context for cultivation is, like the last question. But preventative measures should be maintained constantly. So for example, if you're using a biopesticide agent, you might have a plan where you preventatively spray it weekly. And because of the nature of the agent, it is totally cool to use it constantly. You don't have a threat of resistance like you have with a chemical compound, and there are other advantages. But it's also possible that your crop is very sensitive to certain compounds, depending on whether they're flowering or fruiting, or whether it's illegal to utilize certain compounds after a certain date. It's very, very context dependent. For us California cannabis home growers growing six plants in our yards, what are the reasonably affordable IPM options? One of my favorite questions that I got is this one. And that's because I got to talk about the five fundamentals of IPM and how some of the most affordable IPM options, which by the way, most people never consider how affordable some of these controls are, or, or a lot of people don't think in the, a lot of people don't think price range and logistics and things like that, but it's incredibly important. And part of the reason for that is because, at least for biocontrol agents, people's first experience is with salespeople, and it's bad optics to talk about price so overtly. Also, affordable is different for everyone, but when you consider the biological, chemical, physical, cultural, and genetic controls, I find that the best investments, the things that are perhaps even less expensive or free, are cultural controls, especially ones that include environmental control. And the reason for that is pretty simple, and I have an anecdote regarding this. 
and I'll try to keep it quick. There is a Gerbera grower that I used to work with, and these growers had an epidemic of sour rot caused by a geotrichum yeast. The problem was that their cutters were harvesting their flowers too quickly. With Gerbera, the flowers and the leaves are produced from the same crown, and when you're harvesting the flowers, you can break off the heel of the flower in much the same way that you would break off the heel of celery from the stalk. If you go too fast, however, you'll just snap off the stem and you'll leave a pretty gaping wound. Well, unfortunately for them, their heat and sunlight were such that the plants were photosynthesizing quite a bit, and that means they were producing a lot of sugar. Well, when this yeast was vectored, by two beetle species that were new to the area, the strawberry sap beetle and the pineapple beetle, they vectored this yeast. And that yeast got onto the very sugary wound, and in short order, it traveled down the trunk and into the crown and rotted it from the inside out. By simply changing how they harvested, and a few other things since they lost 10 to 12% of their crop, as a result, which is incredibly grievous for this particular greenhouse. They were able to ameliorate the situation by allowing their cutters to cut at a slower pace, a little bit less production, but this small cultural control allowed there to be way less wounds and many less infection rates, which allowed them to revive themselves and remedy their epidemic problem. Crop scouting is also super important, like I've detailed already. If you're not scouting your crop, you don't know what's going on. And if you don't know what's going on, a small problem can become a large problem very quickly. It is not super expensive to be preventative in this way. It is way less expensive than the labor it costs to patrol the pest, patrol the crop, and treat it, and buy product, etc least undervalued, most often forgotten cultural practice to prevent pests. I really liked this question as well because I got to drone on about crop scouting again. Due to how important it is, I chose crop scouting. And you also have to document your scouting. That's just as important as crop scouting. You have to actually have a dedicated scout or scout team. You have to patrol and sample in an appropriate way. And then at the very end of it, you need to have records, preferably digital records, to show what you saw, where you saw it, and that sort of information, and what time and what week, and that sort of thing. Over a span of like three years, six years, 10 years, for some of these farmers and people who have been growing for their entire life, they have these very accurate records and readings and sensors and environmental information. And even if you don't have all of that information, you can still make some pretty important guesses about what's causing certain pest pressures to rise or fall. You can track that data and you can come to an answer. A lot of people don't do this and I think it's because, well, I often joke that uh, biosecurity is like security work in that nobody wants to pay for it until after they're robbed. And um, that's not true for everyone. But I can really tell the people who are really serious about IPM and pest control over the people who feel like it's an afterthought, because the people who come to me before they have a problem seem to really understand and really want to keep themselves from having a problem. A lot of times they're people who worked in a place that didn't do that and either were shut down or they lost a whole bunch of business or had to lay people off. People who let things get to a breaking point are going to not be in business necessarily, especially if their crop is not a high-value crop, where that kind of thing is t more tolerable. How late into flower is it safe to spray soybean oil-based IPM treatments? There isn't really a clear answer to this. It depends a lot on where you are, what your products are, etc. But I would say that in particular... Assuming that we're talking about cannabis, I feel like, personally, I'm not comfortable applying uh, very late in flower. Other people have different opinions on this. In other crops, even though I don't think this was the intent of the question, I think it's important, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention it, that flowering happens in 
other crops too, uh, fruit crops, orchards, and applying certain compounds or certain bioinsecticides are not a good idea when the plant is flowering. Honeybees are a great example for this. There are definitely products out there that are applied to like orchards, for example, that clearly state, do not apply this compound after flowering. And the reason for this is because the compound gets into the flowers, the honeybee or another organism will take it up during nectar feeding and become sick or possibly die and you don't want to contribute to colony collapse disorder, do you? So read the label, be aware of what the label says, and please, for ecological health, be ethical, and don't spray inappropriately. What is a realistic timeline for predator mites to become effective? For example, using Persimilis for a mite problem. Very good question. There are a lot of details that augment this, like your release rate, what your crop is, what are your additional treatments in addition to biocontrol if you have any, etc. But um, if you're not crop scouting, you can't really tell what's going on anyways. And without an established protocol for evaluating efficacy, you're really not making more than um, a guess. And your gut feeling might tell you that you see mostly some good change, or maybe you don't see very much change, but if you don't, I mean, good isn't a number, but a number is a number, and a number you can evaluate and you can be objective with, but uh, it looks a little bit different, it looks a little bit better, it's not really, it's not really a great way to go about things, especially on a commercial level where money and time and resources are incredibly scarce and always in short supply. But to answer the question, in my opinion, for Persimilis controlling spider mites, I would expect some sort of control, maybe like 10%, 25% less, depending on what's going on, in about one to two weeks. If I don't see that, I would seriously consider things like, did I apply something that killed them? Is it a quality control issue? Is this a new buyer? What's going on with the microclimate? And I would try to assess things like this, because there's a bunch of different factors that can affect that. But I would expect in optimal conditions for one to two weeks to be a good time for efficacy. With rate being one of the biggest factors to consider, it's possible in certain cultivation sites that you need more than the standard recommended amount. And for no particular reason, no obvious reason, that just seems to be the case. I've encountered that myself where the recommended rates were too low or they were too high. So you have to be aware of your own unique situation, and if it's your first time using biocontrols, you kind of have to experiment. Best preventative predator species and how to keep them happy. Alyssum. Totally depends on the target pest. Not all predators affect the same target. Many predators are specialists or they're generalists, but they only affect certain organisms very well. Characteristics that make good preventative predator species are pollinivorous predators, ones that eat pollen, because you can establish them with a crop that produces a lot of pollen, and then they can subsist on this pollen, and if they're the kind of organism that can feed and reproduce on the pollen with no problems, like Swirskii, for example, then you can have a veritable army to go and meet an establishing pest population and wipe them out way before they become any sort of problem for you. Not all biocontrol agents feed on pollen, and not all biocontrol agents can subsist in the crop because some, like specialists, only eat the prey. If there is no food, they will die. Or move on. Where is the best source for beneficial predators if they're unavailable locally? Whether they're available locally or not, I think that this is a very contentious question, and I know that it's important to consider a wide range of factors when it comes to biocontrol companies in particular. Not one biocontrol company is superior. There are a lot of reasons for this, but almost all of them have to do with the particular cultivator and cultivation site and what their resources are and what makes sense for them the most. We've already touched on the fact that some recommended rates are too low or too high for certain areas and they can get by with more or less. 
It's also true that the price changes, and some organisms are way more expensive than others. If you're dealing with a pest that has really expensive predators, then this will be a bigger factor. If you're dealing with a pest that has very cheap predators, it might be a lot easier to buy more and just simply call it a day. Also, some companies sell their organisms or, or some of their organisms secondhand, and those ones should be avoided at all costs. You want to get your organisms fresh as early as possible. For a lot of places, they ship weekly. What chemical pesticide do you recommend that is non-systemic? Have issues with root aphids at the moment. This is another where you are and what products are available to you matters a lot. Without that context, it's hard to say. Pyrethrin, for example, is not systemic, however, and is often used to combat root pests like root mealybug and other organisms. But root pests, especially root aphids, are very pernicious and hard to control with biological and chemical agents. In a lot of ornamental horticulture, if you get a root pest, you just get rid of the plant entirely. The higher value the crop plant is, the less and less culling becomes a viable or attractive answer. What are your best organic IPM practices? Well, everyone has a different definition of organic, but without getting into that topic, in general, I would say crop scouting with documentation, most important, biological over chemical controls, mostly from a tolerance and resistance standpoint, although it is true that certain biological organisms can be resisted to a degree. Preventative over curative actions, always. An ounce of prevention is definitely worth a pound of cure. As the value of the crop increases, this becomes more and more apparent. Multifaceted versus single treatments, in other words, having a holistic approach versus isolated strategies and culling unnecessary plant life. Really easy to do, and it's a great way to get rid of havens for pests that would otherwise be much further away from you if it wasn't for the fact that there was a pet plant that somebody is growing, or a crop plant that's not necessary there, or some part of the landscaping. Castor beans are a very big example with spider mites and lace bugs and, and even broad mites. It's not a very good thing to have nearby unless you're treating it like you're treating your crops, because it does produce a lot of pollen, and that's another example of a companion plant for Swirskii. How long can various pests survive without a plant to host off of? Thrips especially. So it depends. Pests and pathogens are very different. Uh, most arthropod pests cannot survive very long, maybe multiple weeks, without food, especially if the environment doesn't change in a way that induces torpor. Many organisms do enter some form of torpor, but others require time or have to be born as a specific form to combat this. Aerophytes are a good example for this. Um, spider mites also will change in response to plant nutrient changes, aphids as well, or and or weather conditions changing. I have a good video on the invasion biology of thrips if you're very interested in this subject, for thrips especially. But other pathogens like fungi and viruses, they can last a very long time in soil or on equipment or in other hosts, although that's not what you asked. So it's important to consider all of the potential pests and pathogens and understand what their residence times can be. It's a very good question, a very important aspect of the bionomics of your pests to consider. How long can they survive without their host? How often can spinosad be applied as a preventative? Do thrips or other pests build resistance to spinosad? Yes. Western flower thrips and other budworms are resistant to certain spinosins or certain populations can be as, at least. But as far as how often you can apply, you need to consult the label. It depends on where you live. It depends on what your crop is. But many pests do build resistance, and you can select for those resistances if you continue to apply the same class of chemical over and over again, because those resistant populations already exist. It's not like uh, Spider-Man where 
uh, Peter Parker gets bit and then he turns in by a radioactive spider and then turns into Spider-Man. These pests already had the resistance, and if you apply the same thing over and over again, you'll just kill the susceptible ones. The non-susceptible ones will be left, they will breed, and then the next time you apply it, it's going to be less and less efficacious. I've seen some pests that can swim in their target chemical. That's how resistant that they've become, how tolerant they are. So it's a very big deal, and it's very important to be very precise with your pesticide applications. When will we begin to see crops with improved resistance to pests? Great question. It definitely depends on whether or not uh, various governments will aid their government agencies and research. It's a ton of research. Although we do see these improvements constantly occurring, especially with regards to pathogens and pests that are incredibly virulent and incredibly difficult to control, like citrus greening disease and the wheat stem rust UG99. These are incredibly noxious pests to deal with. A lot of our best research happens at government facilities, but more and more, agriculture is, is cast on the wayside with regards to government spending and aid. The more this happens, the more likely it is that we will be under threat from these pathogens, which very well and have done before wiped out entire crops or entire cultivars. Grape phylloxera is an infamous example in viticulture. We also have the fusarial pathovar that destroyed certain cultivars of banana in South America. And I'm absolutely sure that something like this will happen in the future, especially with the way that government aid is going. Great question though. Can broad mites survive the cold winters of northern Michigan in the Upper Peninsula? Tarsonomids do not survive freezing. However, populations can survive in human shelters and greenhouses all year. And for many pests, including broad mites, it's in these uncontrolled oases that populations continue to exist. I know that the question probably meant, can they survive outside in the cold, harsh winters? Well, yes if they're sheltered appropriately. But for a lot of pests, they cannot exist in the local environment without greenhouses. And a lot of pests rely on being transported by humans to these little islands, which if they weren't there, would totally wipe out the population. But because they're there, they will continue to exist and populate. Do russet mites overwinter in soil or only inside the stems of plants? Are nematodes effective for cleaning old soil? Nematodes are not effective for cleaning old soil. If you're going to clean old soil, you should sterilize it. Or you should get new soil. Nematodes are a very expensive way to not be sure if you got rid of everything. And it would be really unfortunate if somebody used a bunch of nematodes, expected there to be no problems, and sure enough, there were still problems. Areophytes don't always exist inside of plants. There are many different kinds of aerophytes, though, so it really depends on the species that we're talking about. A lot of times, like other organisms, they will overwinter in the debris of their host, or they will overwinter in the soil. But aerophytes require a particular form in order to pull this off, called a dudagyne. Dudagynes, regardless of species, look more like each other than they do look like the other female forms of their particular species. Dudagynes are the overwintering form, and without that, russet might have a harder time dealing with stressful conditions. And that's it. If any of my answers weren't very clear, or you'd like additional information, please comment below. If you have any more questions, please feel free to make them below, or contact me on various social media. I like answering these questions, and I like allowing people to comment on them and expound on them if necessary. So please send more questions to me, and I'll be making more videos of this variety for the future.